Hello and welcome. It's always a good time when you are discussing food with none other than uh, Mr. Veer Sangvi. Thank you so much for speaking to us. No, it's my pleasure. The Indian pantries, it's a very interesting read. A lot of my myths were busted because like I thought what? tomato, potato were indigenous to us, not realizing it was good old bengan yeah. that was actually grown in India. Now, similarly, we always thought that all fruits were uh, have been grown in India, but yeah, we have got banana and mango to mango, our credit. Mango. Mango, mango is the one we should be proud of. You find mangoes everywhere, but even if they did start elsewhere, they started in India at the same time. Nobody brought them to us. The interesting one is the chili. When you look at Indian food, you can't really imagine Indian food without the chili. And yet the chili was introduced to India probably by the Portuguese who'd got it from South America and from the Spanish and the Italians and from Columbus and all of those people. And they took the same chili around the world. They took it to Africa where you have a peri-peri masala. They took it to Goa where the peri-peri chili is, again, the key to their local masala. And they made it all over this part of the world, an essential ingredient. Now, it's interesting that nobody else took the chili and made it as important to their food as Indians did. Mm. Why was that? Well, mainly, I think, because we used to use pepper for tikhanas and the chili added a different kind of tikhanas. But there is a complication to it, which is that if you go, say, to Nagaland, you go to Mizoram, the chili is a very important part of their cuisine. The theory is that the Portuguese or some colonialists took it to Nagaland or Mizoram or Arunachal. But these were places that were close to everybody till about 100 years ago. So maybe the odd missionary went, but it's very hard to believe that a missionary went to Nagaland carrying a Bible in one hand and a chili in the other. So if you look at, say, Thailand, where the chili is again very, very big, yeah. Sichuan in China, where the chili is a key ingredient, you begin to wonder about this whole colonial origin. There is a theory, and the Koreans have this theory, because they've done DNA tests, that the chili grew wild in places like Eastern India, Burma, Thailand, and that it wasn't just a South American chili. DNA evidence suggests that we have our own chili. You do your research, which was the biggest myth for you that was busted, which you th all along thought you knew it, and you were like, hey, it's not ours. That, in, well, it was busted during my travels, the idea that Indian food is Indian food. Maybe we got biryani from elsewhere, but everything else is ours. It's not true, biryani is actually ours. Pulao may be Middle Eastern. But things like the jalebi, which you think of as being an essential part of Indian cuisine, the samosa, which we eat every day, these are Middle Eastern foods. They still eat them in the Middle East. They came to India, we tweaked them, but they're not originally Indian foods. Are there one trend that you feel is highly overrated? Or one cuisine that is highly overrated? You know, I could tell you that Indian Chinese is strange and that the Chinese would not recognize it as Indian Chinese. Like the chop suis are actually That's American. Right. Oh, Manchurian. Chicken Manchurian was invented in Kulaba. That's <laughs> only part of China. Or you look at the sushi rolls, which are passed off as Japanese cuisine. Any self-respecting Japanese person would pass out if you fed him a sort of masala tuna sushi roll or whatever. But my argument is don't despise it if people like it, if there's a demand for it. Don't worry about authenticity. Let them enjoy it. Three dishes that you've tried but you'll never try again. Oh, fermented fish in Iceland. When it comes to meats, I'm a bit of a Gujarati, a meat-eating Gujarati, I have to say, but I don't like organ meats. I'm not a fan of animal liver. I'm not a fan of brain. I'm not a fan of kidneys, that kind of stuff. Mumbai ka bheja fry has completely bypassed. Mumbai ka bheja fry eats my bheja. <laughs> <laughs> I would never eat it, no. So I have often, in the interest of experimentation, tried organ meats and offal, but I'm Sorry to say I hate it. I'm also not very keen on smelly fish. Yeah. I love good fish. I love fresh fish. And fresh fish on the whole should not smell. But the fish you get in India often smells. And that puts me off. Which is something that Indians can truly say it's other than mango. Actually. Garlic, the pepper, not the chili pepper, but the real pepper. pepper was purely Indian. It's still among the best pepper in the world. And the original colonialists, the Dutch, the French, the English, came to India in search of pepper. So, yeah. So, the best Indian cuisine, according, that you've tried? At a personal oh, it's a hard one, yeah, but I would say Kerala. Mm. 
And there's a reason for that because cuisines are created by communities. But in Kerala, you have, until recently at least, three communities coexisting peacefully. You have the Muslims, you have the earliest Christians in the world, the Syrian Christians, and you have the Hindus. All three have distinctive cuisines and yet the areas of overlap. Nowhere else in India do you find so much overlap and therefore so much diversity. So your fondest food memory, I read about the fact that as a child when you saw the bhutta and you said, mm. oh, it's ours, but then we realized it was not ours. Nothing but was ours. <laughs> nothing was ours. I know. So fondest... But Bhelpuri, Bhelpuri is ours. I actually grew up in Bombay on, we didn't call it chart then, we called it Bhelpuri or Save or something. And I think Bhelpuri is probably my earliest memory. And dahi batata puri, which they used to also make as my great memory. And now I will eat pretty much anything at any fancy restaurant, but my last meal would be bhel puri. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Thanks.